even after a Marxist revolution, this would be a fundamentally unequal society because different people have profoundly different abilities and those abilities have material impact in the lives that we live. A Marxist revolution can't make some people good at math if they were bad at math before. There's always going to be an unequal distribution of various skills and abilities. And in fact, the famous Marxist dictate is from each according to his ability to each according to his need, which in and of itself implies the existence of differences in ability. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, even many people who consider themselves leftists don't understand that distinction. That was Frederick DeBoer. I'm Natasha Mott, and this is Neo Academia. Freddie's a writer and self proclaimed old school Marxist. His first nonfiction book, The Cult of Smart, was highly contentious as it argued that we should recognize the role of heritable intelligence when considering social policy, especially around education. His new book, How Elites Aid the Social Justice Movement, is available as of September 2023, and of course, he has a Substack that I rather enjoy. Speaking of Substacks, you can find this whole podcast, show notes, and more on my Substack at theorygang.io forward slash newsletter. Thanks for hanging out with me. As always, I hope you enjoy this episode. And thanks to my sponsor, Big Nerve. I've been working with Big Nerve for a while now to develop a community of innovative, creative thinkers. And their goal is simple. They want to recognize and fund creative thinkers. They're trying to create an entire new profession of innovation where catalysts like me could ask interesting and engaging questions and innovators like you can answer them. There are many different ways to play. You can ask questions, answer them, rate answers, mentor answers. All of this earns you points. At the end of the month, these idea tournaments pay out to the top 30 participants and everybody gains some more experience points and gets known for their expertise. This game is meant to elevate creative thinkers and their ideas. To join my team, you'll have to click on the Big Nerve question in the Theory Gang newsletter, where each episode I'll design a special question relevant to the guest and discussion. All right, here's the episode. Now don't forget to listen all the way to the end for the question. You're a serious guy, but you go by Freddy, right? That's right. Okay. I think you're kind of funny. Do other people think you're funny? It depends on the context, yeah. <clears throat> So the thing I read that I was laughing aloud recently was the piece you did on Agnes Callard mm -hmm. on travel, this particular piece. She's talking about travel. And for anybody who hasn't read it, she's kind of taking up beef with travel and kind of how people enjoy travel intellectually. And, and you took a serious issue with that. So I'm wondering, do you think if you're a philosopher, your whole life is just a target in a sense? No, I think that if you <clears throat> consent to participate in and market a profile in the most prestigious magazine in the world about your somewhat unconventional romantic life, and you are a public commenter who engages in provocation, like intentionally provoking people by saying that travel does not actually produce uh, insight or personal growth, you have forfeited the right to expect those things not to be brought up. I mean, Collard's essay, Agnes's essay, was very personal. It was just very personal about broad swaths of people rather than about any individual. She explicitly suggests that people are not having meaningful experiences that they believe that they are, and she expresses with a great deal of disdain the idea that um, what they take to be transcendent experiences are transcendent. Mm. I don't see that in any meaningful sense as being less insulting or less personal uh, than pointing out that her unconventional family life itself in involves certain leaps of faith on her part and a part of her partner. And so I pointed that out. Okay. So, you're, so your jam is just kind of pointing out logical inconsistencies, maybe? I don't know. I wouldn't put it that way. I am a writer, and I like to look at other people's pieces of writing and I like to respond to them in ways that hopefully deepen everybody's understanding of what's been written. Again, when you judge the way that Collard was judging others, you invite judgment in return. And mm -hmm. the thesis of her essay was that travel is not actually enriching or enlightening in the way that people want to believe it was. As I said in my piece, I think that it's transparently the case that what really happened is that She's annoyed at reading other people online talking about how uh, moving and enlightening travel was. And so she jerry-rigged an argument for, for why that's not true. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's another version of that piece, which is simply saying 
travel does not have to be enlightening or, or uh, deepening of character to have value. She could have written that version. There's another version that says that r travel is not always enlightening, and that's okay. Um, but instead, she wrote a, a version that I felt, felt was quite judgmental, and so I judged in kind. Um, yeah. And I think that the you know probably the biggest point is that, as I said and other people said, the observation that you know travel is done in fear of death is just an observation that you can make about literally any human activity. I mean, if you're saying that the purpose is to prevent people for to, to prevent yourself from sort of grappling with your own mortality, that's why we do everything. And so that doesn't strike me as being particularly profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wonder, I don't know her personally at all, but I know you said in, in your piece that, you know, you, you cited, I think when you went to Bali with your dad, when you were 13, your own experience and how you're like, I don't really care if I'm an enlightened tourist or not when I travel. And I wonder if that's going to go back to the way that you grew up versus the way that she grew up. I don't know anything about her, but I know that probably very few people went to Bali and hung out on a topless beach and did the things that you did when you were 13. So is this like not caring about being enlightened, the enlightenment itself here? I mean, I guess you could make the, the case that there was a status element to this. I should say that I didn't just go to Bali once. My father was a professor and we were in, in Bali and around various parts in Southeast Asia a lot when I was young because he was doing his research. And I, you can certainly say, well, you know, my ability to not care about whether I'm an enlightened traveler or I'm just a tourist is a function of my comfort with the, the level of travel and sophistication that I have. I guess you could say that. But again, if you are a University of Chicago tenured prof philosophy professor writing in The New Yorker, I don't think that you have a position or in a position to make uh, arguments about, you know, your relative lack of sophistication or perceived sophistication. Hmm. OK, so but but you have your own thoughts about the university system, right? So what does that even mean to be a University of Chicago professor writing in, you know, for The New Yorker? What what well, what is that right now? I mean, look, like I've written plenty. I mean, I, I am very, a very consistent critic of both our, our university system and of the elite media and the various systems to which they promote people. But I also think that fundamentally, there is a powerful screening effect so that you really do have to be deeply read and pretty smart to be a, a tenured professor at the University of Chicago. And you really do have to be a talented writer and Agnes is a talented writer and someone who's perceptive in order to get into the New Yorker. Both of those things, though, are also um, entangled with really complicated status uh, games that are sort of all of us are involved with, at least if we fancy ourselves educated and sort of sophisticated people. Patronage is a big part of both academia and media, I know, because I've been in both for my, you know, most of my adult life. I grew up in academia, so... I would never suggest that being a, a tenured University of Chicago professor and a writing in the New Yorker so denotes a certain level of necessary sort of intelligence or sophistication. But I know that Agnes is that sophisticated. And yeah. again, like to go into the New Yorker and say, and to make these sort of claims about the appeals to sophistication of other people, when people are saying, you know, I went to on this trip and it, and it deepened and, and it enlightened me. To do so from that perch, I think, necessarily kind of makes you look like a jerk. Yeah, it was it was provocative. But the way I read it when I when I first saw that article was this isn't really about what we think it is to me. And I, maybe I'm reading it through a different lens at this point. I, I put on I moved to Nashville recently, so I like I'm trying on my conservative hat and I put it on and I thought this is a anti-travel piece kind of from the perspective of like, we don't need to travel as much. It's it's like this degrowth leftist, uh, we don't need this kind of superfluous bullshit. Type. You don't need it, right? Not, not I don't need it. I'm still going to travel. But you peasants don't need it kind of thing because you don't even enjoy it. <laughs> hmm. Well, I mean, look, like I, I think that the lurking background reality here is that travel has become dramatically more accessible in the last decade or two. Because things associated with travel keep getting cheaper in absolute terms, or excuse me, in relative terms, and the number of people who are regularly traveling in the United from the United States, but especially from other parts of the world, is dramatically increased. 
And also the amount of knowledge about different places that you can travel to is now vastly more accessible. And so anyone uh, can spend five minutes um, looking at a website about, you know, quote unquote, hidden gem travel locations or follow Instagram feeds that show you such places. The problem is that um, accessibility necessarily uh, dramatically increases the number of people who are taking advantage of travel. And so a lot of the places to travel to have become much less pleasant. Um, just to pick a couple of examples of places of uh, personal experience, like Amsterdam and, and Reykjavik, like Amsterdam, I was, I was in there a couple of years ago and, you know, even compared to the first time I went in 2004, maybe 2003, 2004, the downtown is unrecognizable, but there, it is just constantly covered with tourists everywhere to the extent that locals just avoid those places at all costs because they're so unpleasant to be around. Same way with, with Reykjavik in Iceland, where whatever fantasy you have about Reykjavik <laughs> being like this quaint seaside Scandinavian town, it's just, it's just all Airbnbs, right? It's, it's bizarre. It's all, it's all Airbnbs and gastropubs. And so we were in this, in this scenario where again, like by the time a destination hits some website as a hidden gem, it's not hidden anymore, right? <laughs> You can find online, you can find these photo sets of Instagram versus reality, which is it'll show you a very composed and beautiful uh, picture of a famous travel destination. And then it'll take a picture of what it actually looks like to be there. And when you take the actual picture, it's just crowds of crowds of people waiting to take their Instagram photo, right? Yeah, I mean, literally, nice. if you go to like the Amalfi Coast, if you go to the Greek islands, if you go to certain places that have become popular in Thailand, or if you go to Bali, where I spent, you know, a significant portion of my youth, everything that looks good to take a picture of, there are people literally waiting in line to take, be the one to take their picture. And that has obviously degraded the travel experience. The less cynical way to look at that in regard to Agnes Scholar's piece is that, you know, she doesn't really say that. She doesn't really come out and talk about that stuff in the essay, but she's sort of saying like, Travel is a less fulfilling experience now. The more cynical way to read it is that she wants travel to be as fun as it used to be. So she's trying to discourage people from doing it in order to reduce the crowds. Right. Well, I don't mean to imply that. I just mean that I think people will see it this way. I think people will see it as the left kind of saying, not everybody can enjoy this. And and I think this aligns with your perspective that you agree, not everybody can enjoy it. Not everybody should enjoy it, which is, I think is not in a line. I mean, I know it's not in a line alignment with what the caricature of the left is. The caricature of the left is everybody should get everything. And this is very much not what you as a Marxist believe. Maybe you want to explain that a little bit. Yeah, sure. The association with the left and egalitarianism, right? Equal, you know, the sort of equality as a political goal is very old and exists for a reason. And it is worth saying that socialism slash Marxism, et cetera, does tend to incidentally produce a great more sort of socioeconomic equality. But the idea that Marxism is about equality is and has always been a, a major misconception. Equality has never been a political goal of Marxism. In fact, both Marx and Engels were Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, the uh, creators of Marxism as a philosophy, the founders, independently arrived at the con conclusion that equality is a nonsensical political goal because any difference between two people, even like the color of their eyes or whether they like ketchup or mustard, can be expressed as an inequality. And so the, pr the pursuit of equality as such doesn't make any sense. I think this is important for a variety of reasons because there's all different axes on which we can consider equality. I would like more socioeconomic equality because I want people who are being exploited to no longer be exploited and because I want people who don't have enough money to earn the things that they need to live to have that money. But the equality function itself is meaningless to me. If I can ensure that nobody was living under exploitation and that people had everything that they needed to live uh, healthy and happy lives, but also there's going to be some fabulously wealthy people. That's fine. I don't care. Right. That's, that's not, that's not of, of interest to me as a Marxist. Uh, I think that people have mistaken the second order effect of equality in socioeconomic status for being the same thing as equality as a goal. And it's important to say, even after a Marxist revolution, this would be a fundamentally unequal society because different people have profoundly different 
abilities and those abilities have material impact in the lives that we live, right? A Marxist revolution can't make some people good at math if they were bad at math before, right? That can't happen. There's always going to be an unequal distribution of various skills and abilities. And in fact, you know, the, the, the famous Marxist dic dictate is from each according to his ability to each according to his need, which in and of itself implies the existence of differences in ability. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, even many people who consider themselves leftists don't understand that distinction. Right. So, so it's safe to say that you believe in the, uh, let's call it prophecy prediction, whatever you want to call it, where capitalism increases production, production increases misery, misery leads to revolution, revolution leads to classless society. Well, let's refine it a little bit, all right? The fundamental Marxist complaint, okay, is about the exploitation of labor power. The core of Marxism is what's called the theory of the labor theory of value, AKA uh, the rate of exploitation, right? <clears throat> Which suggests that capitalism is a system that relies on some sort of shared understanding of equivalent exchange, meaning there have to be prices that people are willing to buy at, which other people are willing to sell at, right? Of course, prices are set by things like supply and demand, and they change, and what is worth something to somebody will be different to somebody else. But fundamentally, if I go into Walmart, and I think a product should be $5, and they're trying to sell it for $50, and that were true throughout the economy if capitalism could not function, right? The capitalism cannot function without some sense in which we both mutually understand that a given price is worth it, right? I might think, oh, this is so expensive, but if I'm willing to pay, then the system is functioning as it's meant to, okay? Mm -hmm. Or from the other, other perspective, if somebody is selling something and thinks, oh God, I'm getting killed here on the sale, but is willing to make the sale, then the system is functioning as it's meant to. Mm -hmm. The problem with looking at capitalism as a series of equivalent exchanges, you then have to ask, where does profit come from? From where does profit arrive, right? If I am a factory owner, I built the factory and I spend a certain amount of money on building that factory on the materials and the manpower, et cetera. And the value of the factory is, is priced into everything that I sell because I need to pay myself back for what I, I, it costs to, to build the factory. And in that factory, I have my machines and they cost a certain amount of money. And then I have raw materials that I use to create the product that I'm going to sell and that costs a certain amount of money. And then I pay workers a certain wage and then that costs a certain, a certain amount of money. We could add up all of those numbers together and come up with a certain price. But if the capitalist sells, the factory owner sells their commodity that they're selling at the price that it costs them to produce it, there would be no profit, right? They would have no reason to do it. They wouldn't stay in business because they'd be producing no profit. Where does then does profit come from? Well, the Marxist percep uh, perception of value is the labor theory of value, which is actually far older than Marxism. For example, Adam Smith, most people think of as a great capitalist philosopher was a proponent of the labor theory of value. That that philosophy says that the the value comes from the worker. That if you actually look at all those different elements that are being involved in the production of that commodity, the only thing that is alive enough to create value, the only part that actually has the agency necessary to create new value in the world is the worker. What's the problem with that? The problem is that that necessarily implies that those workers are creating a certain amount of value that is they, they therefore then do not capture in terms of their wages. In other words, it's not that in, under capitalism, bosses and factory owners, et cetera, incidentally underpay their, pay their labor. It's not that they are just choosing to pay workers less than they're worth. It's that for profit to exist, workers must be underpaid. That's why the, the, another way to talk about surplus value is to say, or excuse me, the, the labor theory of value is to call it like the rate of exploitation, right? Because workers are being exploited because they're creating value that they don't capture. Whereas the person who does the least, the ownership class captures that value. Mm -hmm. That is the fundamental observation and critique of Marxism. That is at the core of everything that, that is happening uh, under Marxism. Now, right. that is not f fundamentally a moral critique. Okay, so as you as you suggested, Marxism is a teleological philosophy, meaning that it believes that there is a, an inevitable march towards history. And in the march towards history, what happens is that there's this this phenomenon which Marx saw as, as his biggest contribution, 
which is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which is that if you have a mature industry over time, the new efficiency gains that a given factory or, or industry or whatever is going to be able to wring out of the process, the ability to find more and more profit and more and more money is going to eventually run out, that eventually you're going to have as efficient of a service as you possibly can, but that because everything else is getting more expensive over time, workers are going to need higher and higher rate rages, which means that the rate of profit is going to go down. And eventually over time, this provokes a, a crisis. The crisis is that workers need more money and higher wages to be able to survive, but businesses can't produce them um, because of the tendency of uh, the rate of profit to fall. And eventually, yes, this leads to uh, revolutionary potential. The, I mean, major observation of the 20th century is that that moment never actually occurred or has not yet occurred, right? That right. the, the teleological elements of Marxism have not come true yet uh, and may never come true. But it's mm -hmm. important to say, yes, you know, Marx was famously disdainful of the idea of convincing people to be Marxists, right? Mm -hmm. Because when the workers rise up, it's not because they've been convinced of the, the correctness of the labor theory of value. It's because their material conditions provoke them to have to rise up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all that being said, I mean, I had a million directions I was going to go with that. But So you don't believe that Marx did this from a moral perspective. Are you in the camp that you think what he was trying to do was come up with some kind of science of economics or? Sure. I mean, it's it is a science of history that implies a theory of economics. So the the, the, the basic observations of Marxism are fundamentally a matter of historiog historiography, meaning you have a theory of history and how and how history works, which then implies a school of economic analysis, which then suggests a given political response to that. Many people divide sort of the descriptive Marxism, which is saying this is how the world has functioned. This is how capitalism arose. This is what is right or wrong about capitalism um, and divides that from prescriptive Marxism, which is this is what should happen as a result or what will happen as a result. Uh, the problem with talking about ideas like Marxism is that they, it's like Freud, where they've been so influential that it's hard to understand what it was like before they, they existed. Marxism's first observation is that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle, meaning according to a Marxist reading of history, what has driven history over the period of the periods of time has been the struggle and the com conflict between different classes within society. So if you look at feudalism, for example, for hundreds of years in Europe uh, and in Japan uh, and other places, the the what sort of set the conditions of society was the conflict between lords and serfs, right? And you had one group of people who were in an upper position, the other people who were underneath them, and the structural relationships between them emerged from like the conflict between those groups, right? That idea that different groups of people at different sort of stages of power within society, uh, that, that they are sort of inherently antagonistic and that that antagonism produces what happens in history, it's very, very common even now for people who are political conservatives, who are diehard capitalists, to just sort of unthinkingly assume that that's true. But at the time, that was a very radical and revolutionary idea. And everything else in Marxism really flows from that perspective. One of the things that Marx was responding to was after the demise of feudalism, right, which again, didn't happen because the feudal lords were like, oh, this is immoral, we should have a more equitable society. It happened because the relative strength of the serfs and the and the, the lords changed. You know, people were saying, well, now we live in a free society, in a classless society. And Marx, Marx's point was to say that, in fact, there are underlying class relations here that are structural and that there's an ownership class that makes money off of rents, which means like stuff that they, money that they get only for owning. And then there's a, a, a worker class, a much larger worker class that earns a wage. So like that, you know, all of that sort of is indeed an attempt to, ha to have a science of history, a science of, of history and of economics. You know, Marx himself was nothing of was not, nothing like a revolutionary. That he didn't see that as his role. So I, I come, I'm coming at this from kind of a Popperian stance, right? Like, right. Have, you, have you read Open Society as a Marxist? I feel like maybe I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Popper's big issue with this, I mean, and is that it, you can't really call it a science. And Popper says that he thinks Marx was 
covering covering up his moral you know expectations by calling this a science and that it doesn't really constitute as a science this kind of stuff is utopian thinking and and then marx disavowed that right and he was kind of like no i don't want to prescribe how to get there like you said but again all of this presumes some kind of like eventual utopia and that there is some kind of eventual destination that we're about to get to and this is the part that i struggle with like how can we presuppose that we'll we'll get to this classless society and that everything will be great there you know when we transcend the kingdom of the material that's a book that's got to be a belief structure because i don't see how scientifically we could ever get there well, I mean, I, I think that if I were Karl Popper and I had defined what the modern world thinks of as science, and then I said, oh, this guy for who died a uh, hundred years ago didn't meet my current definition of science, I would find that, that a, to be a weird sort of causation, right? Like, of course, if you're the guy who's defining science for everybody and you do it so in such a way as to exclude these claims, and then you say that those are unscientific claims, well, that's just sort of tautological, right? I'm not interested in the sort of meta, meta argument about whether or not what Marx was doing was science. I think that, again, if you want to def, def, divide the descriptive from the prescriptive claim, Marx's description of a society in which uh, the majority works for other people and can contribute value to those people that they then do not capture, but rather than the large majority of that value goes to the people who are able to capture it simply because of ownership. I think that's just true, right? Mm. I think that is just, it is in a certain sense indisputable that, mm. th that the basic reality is most of us go to work every day. And when we do so, we work for institutions, corporations, businesses, whatever, that where they would not employ us if we did not produce enough value. Uh, but by the very nature of profit, they can't pay us equivalent value to what we're making and they hoard it for themselves. I think that that's just true. Mm -hmm. I think that you can make, there's certainly an argument to be made that I think that I've made a version of in the past that like, look, one of the things that defines Marxism is that Marx was writing in London in the 1800s, which was, you know, the explosion in the industrial revolution. He watched the entire society, like the physical landscape be transformed in a short number of years. And so his vision of what capitalism was, was very much centered on this vision of like a factory that produced physical objects where people came to work and they produced those physical objects. And they were at the risk of life and limb because the safety standards were terrible and the working conditions were squalid and they were earning terrible amount, uh, terrible pay. And it's that the, the theory is less generalizable than that in a, in a modern world where that still describes the the conditions for a, a huge portion of the human race. Most of those people now, though, are in Vietnam or Mexico or China or Bangladesh producing those goods where they were once in the sort of major Western nations like the UK. But also that there's rise of people like me, right? which is like, am I part of the ownership class or am I a part of uh, the working class? And that's a dip, kind of difficult calculus to take because, or to figure out because I, in a certain sense, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I guess you would call me a contractor or an independent contractor or a small business owner. And in that sense, there, there's an ownership sense here, but I don't have stock. I don't actually own anything. The servers that I use aren't owned by me. And fundamentally, I'm creating value that's being captured by Substack. If I wasn't, I would be creating value that would be captured by Google in the form of Google ads, or I would be creating value that was being captured by the New York Times. Yeah, so and you'd think be you the can... petite bourgeois. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, like, and even, but even like the sort of the concept of the petite bourgeois, you know, is the idea of people who uh, own some degree of investment vehicles, but who pr derive the pr you know, primary part of their money from from wages, right? Mm -hmm. But the petite bourgeois was not really an economic category. It was Marx's attempt to understand why people who are not workers so often act like members of the ownership class. And these are people who have the mindset of someday I'll be rich and someday I'll be a part of the ownership class. Look, I've told people, I've I've written a whole long piece about why I don't push young leftist people to be Marxists because I don't think that it's of particular partic political value right now. I mean, if I met a 20-year-old who is really passionate about changing the world in accordance with left-wing principles, I would certainly hope that they would read some Marxist texts because they are very valuable for understanding how the world works, but I don't push people to be Marxists. Fundamentally, 
though, I think the core most valuable portion of Marxism for a modern audi audience is to understand that the antagonism between rich and poor is not incidental, right? That it's not that like the rich people we have are just bad baddies who want to do the wrong thing and hurt people. And that's why we have poverty and inequality. It's that the very way in which value is extracted from our society is structurally set up to be to result in a small ownership class and a larger working class. And, and whatever else has changed, that has not changed. It remains the fact that a vast majority of what we might call the investment vehicles in uh, the United States are owned by a small ownership class. So that, yes, a lot of people have a 401k now, right? But it's it's pennies compared to the actual like ownership of factories, of airlines, of server farms, to the ownership of land, right? And that condition hasn't changed. And right. and again, like this is not a moral argument, right? The the whether it's the rich it is, to be honest. Yeah. Whether the rich are good or bad is totally irrelevant in a Marxist analysis. It personal personal morality is just not functioning into it at all. Right, right. So would it be safe to say that you lean more on the anarcho-communist side? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, look, it depends, right? Marx and his early followers were pretty circumspect about not being overly deterministic about what what, what follows a, ca a capitalist revolution. Okay. You have... The capitalist period. So again, like we have these 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 successive phases of history. I think one thing that's really important to understand is that for Marx and Marxism, capitalism is an absolutely necessary precondition of any kind of socialist state. Right. Okay. So, um, well, it's, it's Mar one of the only things that was necessary, you know, because I mean, right. Mar Marx was fascinated by capitalism. He thought capitalism was an incredibly powerful force. He was enchanted by its productive capacity. He just also saw how much misery and exploitation it was res resulting in. But as he said, you need to have the productive power of capitalism to modernize society, to industrialize the society, and to create the conditions in which socialism would have happened. If Marx had been there in 1917 in Russia, he would have told them, this isn't going to work because you're trying to go directly from a feudal society to a right. socialist society without the great productive period of, of, of capitalism happening. Marx says, eventually, there's going to be this conflict where th there's not going to be sufficient generation of profit to keep uh, capital happy, and they won't be able to raise wages sufficiently to keep uh, the workers solvent in the basic terms of being able to afford food and clothing, etc. This will provoke various crises of capitalism, which he thought, he hoped, uh, would lead to some sort of a revolution. This revolution was would be a worldwide workers' revolution, revolution, or really a cascading series of workers' revolutions across the world, which would wipe out capitalism. You would have a period called the dictatorship of the pro proletariat, which is a temporary period in which the workers basically act as dictators over the system in order to quash attempts by the, the formerly powerful to get back to their old station. Mm -hmm. What and comes after that? Back. They'll just yeah. get back the power, right? Right, right, right. What comes after that? Well, he didn't really say, and, and, he, and he said directly that he didn't really want to say because he said, I don't have a crystal ball. To the extent that he sketched anything, right, it's a vision of a post-statist, so no formal government in the sense that we think of it now, sort of society based on semi-autonomous communal bands which people can move into and out of as they want. So the commune and communism are these bands of people that operate under shared understanding of what's right for society. You have the right of exit so you can go someplace if you don't if you don't like it here. But they all basically operate under the principle of, you know, from each according to his ability. So everybody who can do something does that something for the society and to each according to their need. If someone needs a coat, we get them a coat. If they need food, we get them food. What that means in, in, in principle is, is under underdrawn for a reason. So I don't really truck with the sort of anarcho-communist sort of line because it's unclear like what the anarcho even refers to in reference to the sort of traditionalist orthodox Marxist position. I am not impressed by modern anarchists and um, I never have been. My understanding of the, of the anarcho-communism argument is 
the dictatorship of the proletariat is the big problem there is that mm -hmm. they they want to make sure that that gets kicked out that mm -hmm. the, that the dictatorship of the proletariat does not become a permanent installation and this is my big issue with marxism because like like agnes's essay it seems that it's this there's a hierarchy where where there's the <clears throat> dictatorship of whoever it will not be the proletariat anymore it will become this new bourgeois new, some new class because there will always have to be some authoritarian control so it's a classless society for everyone except the people who are ruling and i find your position and interest particularly fascinating because you as an academic and i heard you say you came from like four generations of phds you saying to hell with the the modern academic system it kind of feels like you know after after it served its purpose for you and your family, now it's kind of like, okay, well, now what? So what, like, I don't know if you have kids or not, but like, if you did, if you do, would you send them to school? What I mean, like, the ruling class is going to be educated always, right. right? So where do you fit into that? All right. So the first thing I would say is that, again, like, as of now, Marx's big predictions about the future have not come to pass. And it's probably looking less and less likely that they ever will. Then again, history is long, so who knows? But in keeping with that, again, like Marx didn't think that like the that the revolution that the 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 revolution against capitalism could happen, or if we worked hard enough, he thought that it was going to happen because it was structurally encoded into the the system of capitalism. It's the same way with the demise of the, dis, of the dictatorship of the proletariat. If you're a really orthodox Marxist, which I'm not, but if you're a really orthodox Marxist. You don't fear that the that the that the proletariat are, are never going to give up their dictatorial powers because you think it's ba baked into the system and into human nature. So, the dictatorship of the proletariat doesn't sort of lay down their powers because they're so principled, because they're such good people. They do so because once you are out, they're free from the exploitation of capitalism. Right? They have no reason to desire dictator dictatorial control. Right? In other words, once they they finally experience life out from underneath the yoke of capitalism and they find that they are free to pursue their interests and to secure their interests of the, themselves and their families without the yoke of capitalism and the ownership class on top of them, there isn't any value in dictator, dictatorial control. It's the same reason why the state withers, right? So there's it's what's it's called the spontaneous withering of the state. It's not that they come and they they knock the, the 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 walls of the city hall down and say no more government, but rather that the functions of government no longer become necessary in the traditional sense because once freed from the cycle of exploitation, people don't need that anymore. Of yeah. course, many people, most people, find this extremely idealistic, and it very well may be. But that's the idea mm -hmm. within Orthodox Marxism. I did not say I wash my hands of academia. Academia washed its hands of me. <laughs> I I had a job in the City University of New York and I got fired. I had been on the academic track looking for a tenure track professor job, but I had a lot of personal instability and also I was a pain in the ass and I had written a lot of controversial political things at a time when it wasn't a good idea to do that if you wanted to be a professor. So I absolutely would send my kids to school. I don't know if you read my first book, but school is good, right? It's just like the definition of what school is for is deeply misguided among many people. So. The idea that school's purpose is to elevate everyone to the same level of educational performance or intellectual aptitude is very new and very wrongheaded. Every bit of evidence suggests that that's not possible. I have, in fact, marshaled a tremendous amount of citations and links and pieces of evidence to that effect in my, in my writing on my newsletter. Most people have an underlying level. Well, I think everybody has an underlying level of intellectual or uh, academic aptitude or uh, predisposition, which they probably can't exceed no matter what we do in terms of schooling. And they're also subject to environmental influences such that it doesn't make a lot of sense to expect a school that exclusively teaches kids from po poverty and deprivation to overcome that poverty and deprivation at school when it doesn't happen at school, right? The analogy that I've made before is it's like, look, everyone wants the, the, the muscle of capitalism to work in schooling. But like the, the idea of capitalism is like, hey, I have a widget factory, right? I sell widgets, I sell and I make widgets. And if I make the best widget, 
then I will have the most successful business. If other competitors do better widgets than I do, I'll, I'll go out of business. So let's, let's apply that to schooling and use that to, to shape children's brains. But just think for five minutes about that. Imagine telling a factory owner, okay, somebody else is actually going to make the widget, right? This is a child's brain. That widget will be extremely sensitive to various factors of who the parents of that widget were. You're not going to get your hands on that widget until they're five years old. You're only going to get to control that widget for six hours every day. The widgets are going to go home to profoundly different environments, so which will spend the majority of their day. Those widgets will have all kinds of racial and environmental variables that impact their level of opportunity, like how much access they have to tutoring and how many of them are fed every, every night and how many of them live in safe and warm environments. And at the, then at the end, I expect you to make all these widgets the same. You as the factory owner would say, that makes no sense, right? Right. That bad analogy dominates our thinking about schooling, unfortunately. I want to, I will send my kids to school when I have them because the purpose of school is to inculcate in them interests of in the world, discover what they're good at and, and what they're not, which is just as important to try to find some way that they can be stimulated intellectually and discover the world for its own purposes. And hopefully to figure out a way that they can be productive in society to the degree that they can own a home have a family, feed their family, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in school in the old school sense that of education in and of itself and for its own sake, and also secondarily as a way to sort of help people sort of soar into different career bands based on their personal interests and strengths. The notion that the point of schooling is to close racial barriers or to make everybody into a grade A student that was always flawed from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the question I have is kind of like, what do we do then? It seems like, you know, your solution is, well, we just deal with the fact that there's going to be a bottom 50% because you mm -hmm. can't change that. And then we hoist those people up in a sense through social means, right? And mm -hmm. you, you say, well, I hope that, sh I sure hope that doesn't affect the top half who believe in some aspects of the meritocracy or whether they believe in it or not, they will, they have, they have actual merit. My question is, is like, what about the middle? You know, cause I know you think and hope that kind of messing with this idea of the meritocracy, even if it's an illusion, I think people need illusions, but I, you think, you seem to think that it's not going to mess with the people on the top end so much. Like we're still going to build rockets. We're still going to be go-getters. I'm not worried so much about those people. I'm worried more so about the people who get hoisted up, who could have had the potential to do something beyond that, but now they feel like because they're the people who need to be hoisted up, they're no longer valuable in this society. Yeah, well, so to begin with, let's let's do the, I, you know, I'm not a social democrat, but I think that like European style, Scandinavian style, social democracy it would be a big improvement over what we have now, right? Look at Denmark, right? In Denmark, you have dramatically higher taxes. You have dramatically lower socioeconomic inequality. You have the lowest poverty rate in the world, just absurdly low poverty. You can play a game where you go to Copenhagen and you try to look for, like, try to walk around Copenhagen long enough so that you can spy five homeless people. Despite it being the biggest city in the country, it will take you hours if you ever find it in the course of a day. And yet, right? There are billionaires in Denmark. And yet in Denmark, there are people who work very, very, very hard to get to the top. In Denmark, there are people who are busy little mer meritocrats who go to school and, and try to climb the ladder and do their best, right? In other words, my point is we have examples in society where there are dramatically stronger social safety nets, where the government owns much more. They have things like sovereign wealth funds and they own a lot of the major industries or the utilities or things like that, where there are high taxes, where there are systems in place that prevent a great deal of inequality. And at the same time, you have human flourishing, you have intellectual flourishing, you have uh, uh, business flourishing, you have scientific flourishing, et cetera, right? So the, the notion that like there is some inherent antagonism between making things better for everyone at the bottom and producing people who really want to flourish, I think is just wrong. And I think it's wrong because human beings like to do shit, right? Like 
if you like, you know, if you look at the internet, you're just probably a decade plus ago, but I was looking at a forum about how to make, it was about people who make tree houses, right? And some of it's like very basic stuff. And some of it is stuff that's really like incredible, like the sort of things that like people will make viral videos out of now, you know, whatever. But it's just, a, it's a forum where people are asking for advice and things. And this guy was talking about the problem with his, he wanted to do, to do this for his kid, but the tree wasn't right, or he couldn't figure out the angles. He didn't know what the materials, whatever. And, you know, a couple of days later, a different member of the forum comes back and it's a PDF of like professionally produced architectural diagrams made in CAD, like with expensive architectural software with information about the materials to use and how to assemble it. It was like 40 pages long. And the guy who had made it as a professional architect, like a, like a construction architect, and he just did it in his spare time, right? Now, under the, the ordinary capitalist philosophy, this makes no sense, right? This was a, the guy was anonymous. He wasn't using his real name. He got nothing out of this interaction, right? He wasn't doing it for pecuniary reasons, but he did it because human beings like to be productive, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm of the of the belief that like under a system under which people were no longer working, you know, eight hour days and coming home exhausted and having to constantly struggle to get just the, the basic things that they need for themselves and their families. They wouldn't be less productive because, oh, I don't need to get off the couch anymore. They would be f much more productive because they would be unleashing their creative potential, right? So that's that's one thing. Maybe, that's maybe. I mean, okay, so my thought, you know, in the, the example about Denmark functions because it's not a, a monoculture. Denmark is not everywhere. And so billionaires exist in Denmark because other people in other places will buy the goods and services produced in Denmark. And so, so my, my biggest problem with all of this is the totality in which I think a lot of leftist thinkers think we have to have these kinds of systems that if everyone has that, this is going to be great. Or if the vast majority of wealthy countries do this, it's going to be great. That's my problem. So I'm like, I'm glad Denmark has that. But I think if we all go around and do that, we're going to see a very different world. And not only that, but I think, you know, your example of the, the treehouse guy what, where and why did he get that motivation? You know, I mean, it, it was because he was cultivated probably in a system that praises achievement. So what if we do away with that system? Yes, we built up enough capital now that we can kind of maybe slow down, arguably. But then after a period of time, isn't it all going to simmer out? Isn't it all potentially going to fade out? Or do you think that without an incentive structure for the middle to low producers, we're going to be able to continue? Well, I guess my preliminary question would be, you could look at like Nigeria, which is a country that has this like band of some of the most fabulously successful engineers and doctors and chemists, et cetera, drug discovery people in the world. I don't know if people are aware of this, but if you look at the a list of the like top five, top 10 highest earning ethnic groups in the United States, Nigerian oh, yeah. Americans are always up near the very top because- yeah. They just produce, reliably produce these brilliant engineers or whatever. And then you have the vast bulk of Nigerian society where there is in many parts of it just absolutely desperate poverty, right? But if you go to Nigeria, if you want to be there, the, there's less restriction on you in what you can do business-wise than there is in Denmark. Uh, and uh, there's less, certainly less taxes than there are in Denmark, right? My question to you would be like, if you had to roll a dice and determine what kind of what what kind of person you would be at the bottom or the top, would you rather roll that dice in Denmark or in Nigeria, right? Where you might be in Nigeria and be a fabulously well compensated cardiologist or entrepreneur, but the odds are much more likely that you're going to be in this huge bulk of terribly poor people. Or you could do it in Denmark and you roll the dice, and even if you're in the bottom uh, quintile of Denmark, you're doing better than ninety percent of the human species, right? I mean. I think that that's it's perfectly fair if you want to say I want to take my take my swings in Nigeria or China, another place where yeah. there's there's more there's more people in China below the international poverty line than there are Americans. Period. But there's also you know super powerful billionaires, right? If you were the kind of person who want to take that swing, that's fine. I think a lot of people, if they were given the opportunity, would say that Denmark deal sounds pretty fucking good, particularly yeah, it does, if they suffered before. But my issue is that I don't think that Denmark deal will be around very long if everywhere becomes Denmark. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that'll be, we'll, we'll all be 
happy, happy Denmark. You know what I mean? I think it'll it'll soon deteriorate into something like Nigeria where. Yeah. But this is the know. problem, right? Like you're not wrong, but why like why will it deteriorate? Well, um, human nature. <laughs> Well, I, I would argue that the reason it'll, it'll deteriorate is because what the, the world has been coasting on for decades now, right, is the existence of producing classes and consuming classes. And so specifically, if you look at the United States and China, the two biggest, most powerful economies in the world, why are they the most powerful economies in the world? Well, what made China the, one of the most powerful economies in the world is by selling goods to the United States, right? We tore down our tariff walls and globalized so that we could have cheap goods from China. It makes Americans happy because I bought a little bookcase for $75. And that's great. Recently, the Chinese liked it because they were moving from a system where hundreds of millions of people were working as subsistence farmers, and they were trying to urbanize them and bring them up out of that poverty. The problem in the long run is what the, what the uh, sort of the, the world is facing now is we need to move China from being a producing co uh, country to being a consuming country. In other words, for the math to work out, for things to continue to grow at the pace of what they're, which, which they're growing, America has about you know, 300 and I don't know, 20 million people and our a population growth is now completely stagnant. We're not getting any bigger. And there's a certain saturation point at which you can't have more and more and more producers and only a certain number of consumers, right? And so you've got the United States, Japan, the EU. We need more consuming countries. China would be an incredible market. The question is, is who then does the producing for China? In other words, who is the cheap labor pool who sells the stuff to China? Well, we've got Bangladesh and we've got Vietnam and we've got a few other places. India looks like it might be the next one, except that India doesn't want to be the, the, the producing country, right? Nobody actually wants to be the producing country. They want to be the rich consuming country. China is facing a lot of internal strife because a lot of people are saying, hey, wait a minute. We've gone through all this. We've done all this development. We want to be the Americans now, right? We want to be the rich and prosperous consuming country. And the issue here is the world is only so big. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and this is one of the things that Marxists said hundreds of years ago, which is that eventually you're going to run out of places to find cheap labor. And so you have the sort of political strife that we've seen with Trump, like we saw with Brexit. Why did that happen? Because the people, the middle classes of these countries who were who had been brought up by industrialization had the legs cut out from underneath them because we moved the producing capacity someplace else. And so, you're not wrong when you say that everywhere can't be Denmark under the current system, but I think that that speaks to like a deeper rot that is not often very uh, sort of, is not very often sort of confronted by by people under capitalism, which is that there is like a structural issue with the sort of globalized economy that we've created, where we don't know how to create growth if there's not new consuming classes, but we don't know where to find the cheap labor in the producing classes, right? Like. China has been having some of its first strikes in a very, very long time recently. Why? Because as they've, the country has gotten richer, that producing class, has their expectations for their uh, way of life has gotten higher and higher. But people are like, wait, 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 you can't, you can't demand higher wages at Foxconn. You're the producing class. You keep the iPhones cheap for the United States, right? And I think that's a real problem that is deeper than just sort of like, well, Denmark, you know, sure, they can share for everybody, but... Somebody's got to be the ones doing the hard work. I think that, that, that these things are like an indictment of capitalism, not of social democracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't think you're wrong there. I mean, and I think the 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 higher education system falling apart in the U.S. is like the canary in the coal mine in my mind because it's like it it's saturated, and I don't think people realize. I don't know how you feel about like Peter Turchin's overproduction of elites. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I feel about this. You know, since I started this podcast, I've kind of had all kinds of thoughts and feelings about it. But I think the truth is, is like all those quote unquote elites are now in a sense, fuel and fodder for the production machine in some sense, like they're not actually elites. And I think that we're just churning people out of the university system and they're just, you know, they're literally cannon fodder for the production. So, I mean, do, do the leftists like kind of hate you for your indictment of people's intelligence and saying that people have finite fixed bands of intelligence and maybe some people shouldn't go to college. I mean, let's get into that. 
Most of them do, yeah. The um, oh, well, look, like again, like it's a question. Like, is is American higher education collapsing? It depends upon like what you see as the purpose of higher education, right? It's it. I I mean, I say this to people all the time, right? We have this like social leveling function, the idea that college is about equality. It's a mm -hmm. very, very new idea. Mm -hmm. That was not what these colleges were founded on. Mm -hmm. If you had gone to Yale in 1900 and you had said, hey, Dean of Yale, how are you guys doing at spreading social justice? <laughs> like, the fuck are you talking about, oh, right? Like, <laughs> right, it's like that, that's got nothing to do with what we do here, right? Colleges traditionally, I mean, yes, you know, like German research universities, of course, existed for the production of knowledge, and they've always done a good job of producing knowledge. But like the actual function of sending people to school at these elite schools for a long time, it was more or less explicitly the case that they were just finishing schools for the elite, right? Mm -hmm. That you had these WASP kids who were born into money and born into positions of influence that everybody knew were going to be to, to lead. These were, you know, your Kennedys, you know, and Roosevelt's, whatever. Where they, they were just part of the leadership elite class. And the idea of college was to network with other people, but also to learn civic values, right? So why were classics such a big part of college to agree that they're not now? Because the assumption was that you wanted to teach these people classics so that they had a sense of how to be good leaders because it was just assumed that they were going to lead. And the reason why the Ivy League schools were in an explicit, like explicit, explicit, as in they wrote about it to each other in letters, conspiracy to exclude Jews is because, you know, the, the educational function of producing the smartest students wasn't even really considered a thing back then. It was just these, of course, these kids are smart. They're high status wasps. So what we have to do is turn them into good leaders and Jews aren't good leaders. We have to keep Jews up, right? It's only around the middle of the 20th century and particularly in the 60s when Colleges sort of start to glom on to this function of, number one, we're the primary engine of social mobility. And number two, we're here to sort of spread social justice. Colleges are survivors. Like part of the reasons I, I don't think we're going to have a, a, a collapse of the American higher education system is that they just survive. Like mm -hmm. there's like I think there's something like 50, no, maybe it's more like 80 human institutions that are more than a thousand years old, including governments, right? Most most governments are not nearly that old. Like the Catholic Church is an example of a human institution that's more than a thousand years old. I think like out of the 80, something like 50 plus of them are are, are universities uh, in different places in the world, right? Because these, these yeah. institutions survive. Close to right? it, close to it. Yeah. So they, but they, they glommed onto these justifications because they're justifications, right? Hey, fund us, we do these things. The notion that college is supposed to create economic opportunity and economic quality is really only as old as, you know, Ronald Reagan's presidency, pretty much. Like I, in my book, I go through and I sort of, I, I lay out, in my first book, I lay out, you know, sort of all these quotes from presidents and they start really getting into this, hey, college is our ticket to a better economy thing around with Reagan. Why? Because prior to Ronald Reagan, right, the great engine of American middle-class prosperity wasn't college. It was union jobs and manufacturing, right? It was the factory at the edge of town, right? So like literally, you know, like my hometown, Middletown, Connecticut has Pratt & Whitney, which produces jet engines. And my friend, Matt, his father, he's retired now, but he worked for Pratt & Whitney. He, I think he got a job like a week after he graduated high school as an 18 year old. And he was there for 50 years. And he started out on the assembly line and by the time that he was finished, his job had the word engineer in the title, right? But if you went to Pratt & Whitney now and you said, I'm, I have a high school diploma, I'm an 18-year-old, I want to end up as an engineer, they'd laugh you out of the room, right? Because now if you want to be an engineer, you have to have a degree, right? Well, what that they do is they tell you they've, they've also lowered the status of engineer. Now anybody right. can be an engineer right. also. Right. So they so the once upon a time, right, this function, this Bruce Springsteen reality of where there was a factory at the edge of town where I could get a good job and I could at least have a little house and, and raise a family. And then those all went away with 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 globalization. Like that was much, much, much more the, the, the existence of, you know, decent, decently paying, you know, lower middle to middle class manufacturing and industry jobs. That was the engine of, of the American middle class, not college. But mm -hmm. then you cut that the legs out from under that stool with policy, right? Because we can make more money if we send those jobs 
first to Mexico, then to China, then to Vietnam, Bangladesh, whatever. So you look at college and you say, hey, college, why aren't you doing the job of keeping the American middle class going? I think the institutions, the colleges can fairly say, when did we ever say that was our purpose, right? Like <laughs> we, were, we, we, got, we got founded to keep a bunch of wasps, you know, entertained for their early 20s before they went off to become senators and things, right? Right. Look, I have a huge number of problems with higher education, but like to a certain degree, it's just a, a misalignment between what's being asked of these schools and what they can actually provide. Right, right. So, I mean, that, that's, I think, exactly in line with what I think is that w these institutions were not created to do the job that they're now being asked to do. They've become this monstrosity. And I think what, you know, we've kind of danced around this platonic ideal of developing the philosopher kings and and this kind of thing. And my major concern is if we don't have the proper institutions to do that, then that won't happen, right? So as we've seen, these institutions are meant to develop, you know, and now it's like the Ivy League are the ones that are meant to develop these philosopher kings or the Kennedys, like you said, those people. But it's not really working because our Kennedys and our philosopher kings have sold us out to the techno-fascists and now we're indebted to them forever. So those are now the actual philosopher kings. They're not even philosopher kings. They're just the, the kings in disguise. So if that's going to be the long-lasting function of the university, how do we then usurp the power from, I don't want to say the capitalists, but from what I think is like the evolutionarily determined structure of the corporation? Like we've hmm. built this thing and it's... It's now taken over and like, we don't know what to do with it, but how do we usurp that power and build something better potentially? Because you say you don't think that the Marxist ideal will happen. And I assume it's because of this ascending techno-fascism that's about to kill us all or whatever. You know, I've, I've spoken at high schools a few times. And when I do, I always start, I, I say this, I say, okay, kids, raise your hand <laughs> if you have dreams that you really want to accomplish. And they all, oh, you know, they, 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 they all raise their hands, right? Then I say, okay, you see everybody who raised their hands? <laughs> now I want you to raise your hand if you think everybody who just raised their hand actually will accomplish their dreams. That's fucked up. That's fucked and up. And none bro. of them raised their hand. That's fucked up that you do that to them. I know <laughs> it's fucked up, but it's an important lesson, right? In other words, they want things for themselves, and but they understand systemically it's absurd to think that everyone's going to get what they want. Zero sum games exist. Right. Zero sum games exist. And so what I was, my first book was trying to say is like, look, we can't create intellectual equality. We can't create equality through the meritocratic system. If there's any connection between how much you actually, how much sort of academic talent or whatever you want to call it. And, and, and look, like I'll be the first to say that what we're talking about is like, stuff that's rewarded by our system, which is not necessarily the only important kind of intelligence, right? Like I, I do believe there are multiple intelligences, but I also think there's some kinds of intelligences that are rewarded in our system and those are not equally distributed, right? And so the whole point of the book is to say, we can't do that. But what we could do is that if we had a society that took care of people a little bit better, we could lower the stakes of not being on the top, right? We can't make everybody equal. But what we can do, because again, I'm a Marxist. That's not my goal. Equal is not my goal. What we can do is we can raise the floor, right? In other words, say everyone can't be equal, but we can make sure that nobody falls below this level, this bottom level of what we're willing to accept people to live with, right? We're not going to accept hungry children, et cetera. And that's a, a message that I think people could resonate with. But unfortunately, it doesn't change the fact that, yeah, there are zero-sum games in the world. And I think everyone understands, like those high school kids, right? They intuitively understand not everybody gets what they want. And so the question becomes like, okay, what is a reasonable thing to want? And I think part of the problem with our system is we're going to send people – I always think this is kind of random, but you know, Napoleon was writing in one of his letters – talking about he had been getting really into patriotism with his soldiers and creating the idea of France, right? Because even in Napoleon's time, the idea of like a country in Europe was not as salient as like a city state or a you know, region or whatever. 
And so one of his lieutenants was asking him, why do you, why are you doing so all this patriotism stuff? And he said, like, I can't get these guys to march through filthy battlefields in freezing weather with rot in, in their shoes and wounds in their guts for a little bit of money. I have to appeal to this ideal of France, and that's how I'm getting them to do it, right? Like you have the justification of a, something bigger that motivates the behavior that can't be motivated just by self-interest. This is what we do in capitalism all the time, right? Yeah. You'll, you're going to be rich. You yeah. will be rich. One, one day you will be the one on Instagram showing, showing off your Lamborghini. Everybody knows cognitively, oh, that's not true for everyone, <laughs> admit, right. but it's going to be true for me, right? Right. And so to me, like the big picture thing is just human, human history is a history of inequality, right? Like mm -hmm. for 300,000 years, we were hunter gatherers roaming the plains. And it's probably the case that the just the biggest, brawniest, strongest guy was in charge of, of our little tribe when we did, right? Mm -hmm. But then as we developed society and civilization, we started to tell this, this, these stories about equality and saying we're all equal under the law, we're all equal in, in dignity, we should aspire to equality, but we've never actually delivered on any of it, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the question I think that's facing people that we're facing right now is it's just like, okay, what's a story we can tell to ourselves without lying to ourselves about what we can accept about who wins and who doesn't, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know that either side of the American political spectrum right now has a really coherent story about that at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's obviously not on either one of those sides, but I think, you know, a little pushback on the thing like we haven't ever achieved that. I mean, you know, if, if you believe the Enlightenment did anything other than create a, like a hedonic treadmill, then you mm. have to believe that we've done something. You know, we've improved literacy rates. We've, you know, pulled people up from poverty. So to say, oh, we haven't made, we haven't done anything or we haven't gotten there, or we haven't made it to equality. No, of course not. But again, I think this is the cognitive device that has been around since Plato to convince the masses that it's possible to transcend their circumstances. And I think what you're doing, what seems like what you're doing is being very explicit about the fact that like, listen, you're not probably going to be able to do this. So here's another deal. And I, I, to be honest, I just don't know how well that's going to work out. Because like, I mean, like you said, I think people do need this illusion. They do need something, some re religion or something to strive for, even if it's not possible. Um, so what is your thought on that? You think you just tell them like it is and they're going to do it or? No, I you look. the high school speech is my question. You know, well, number well, number one, I yeah. So here's how I finished the high school speech. You have to learn how to make peace with not getting the things that you want, right? Mm, okay. Like I tell them, I tell them in the high school speech, you have to understand that, like, if you're lucky enough to be where we are, which is like in like the de the developed world, where the odds of you literally starving are very low, and if you're not the vi the victim of you know, repeated violence or abuse. If if you're lucky enough to just be someone who's one of us who is like able to sleep in a bed every night and have a meal every day, then like the default state of your adult life will you, will be boredom and disappointment, right? Like that's <laughs> that's just like how things normally are for most of us. <laughs> but there's a lot of lovely things that happen as well. The question with for you is like, how can I set expectations and how can I define what I want in such a way that I'm not making myself crazy all the time? So that's like the interpersonal work, okay. right? Like, what do I live with? What can I live with? Nobody gets everything that they want, right? Never. For example, you said, do I think that that's going to work to just tell people rationally? No, of course not. I don't, I don't <laughs> think I'm going to, I don't think anything like what I want is going to happen in my lifetime politically. I do think that there could be a long-term drift in human society because I do believe in progress and I do mm -hmm. think, think that things get better towards people saying, Maybe we should be less oriented towards the big swing, right? The, mm. the, the hope and desire for that unlikely billionaire status mm. and more oriented towards doing right by all the people who, who are not going to be that billionaire, right? right? And I think that that doesn't take a revolution. And I think that you can just sort of gradually orient your society more towards, yes, like, like physically and monetarily in terms of like, hey, let's build in a stronger safety net so that the people who swing and miss yeah. don't land on their ass, right? But also right. psychologically, right? right. And the problem right now is that like everything in popular culture is oriented to tell, towards telling you that like there's a million ways to be a loser and only one way to be a winner. <laughs> 
I like that. I mean, I think you're right because I think these big swings, whether they be idealistic or for control, I don't know the big swings are the right way. I think evolution requires, natural, natural selection requires that we facilitate our needs right here and now. And that we also have foresight in the future, but it's a continual process through Bayesian reasoning that we've developed the ability to do this. Now, as for the institutions, you know, designing who the leaders are going to be, I don't know that you answered that, but you mean me... absent meritocracy, like, like, like if, like if we're not, if we're not rewarding or, or we're not building everything based on the notion that everybody can be a, a, a you know, Stanford educated Google uh, programmer. Look again, it is inevitable that there will be some sort of leadership class, just like it's inevitable. There's going to be some sort of intellectual class mm -hmm. and many, many people just opt out of the pursuit of being those things. I think it's important to say that like one of the things that's happened as we've come to associate college as the goal for everyone is that we just assume that anyone who does not have a enviable college diploma is someone who was like deprived of it. But many people in high school will sort of look around and say, this isn't it for me. I'm not interested in this, right? So it's there's never really going to be a leadership class. Unfortunately, the sort of mechanisms in place to select that leadership class are based on things that have little to do with leadership, right? Like in other words, whatever your position on Elon Musk, right? What selected him into his position whether you're like a so a fan of his and you think that he got to where he did in business because he was smarter than everybody and was a great entrepreneur, or you're a critic of his and you think that his family fortune was, was sort of what made it happen. Either way, none of those things would imply that he is someone who should like necessarily be a leader of men, right? Like success in business is not necessarily the same thing as being good at leadership. Those things will probably remain broken for as long as I'm alive, those, those sort of selection mechanisms. But again... I just think that people are ambitious by nature. And I, I, I think there's an underlying assumption that people are ambitious and they strive and they pursue and they fight and they learn in order to achieve a certain kind of a status. When I actually think if for me, you know, I have very weird and idiosyncratic kinds of ambition, but at those kinds of ambition, it's all just, it's just pure, purely for me, right? I've never, yeah. I've never written a single thing just for money yeah. because that's just not what motivates me. And I think a lot of other people are weird like me in that way. I am too. And that's like a perfect way to close. Like I read your, something you wrote in that piece about Agnes and you said, it's the height of, of hubris to think that you can ever occupy a mental space so outside of yourself that you can write for others and satisfy the dictates of enthusiasm and sincerity at the same time. I was just like, chef's mm. kiss. Like, I, I mean, hats off to that because you're, you're absolutely right. Like you have to satisfy internal personal goals. And I think you're right. I believe in people that in doing that, there is some inherent satisfaction and validation that produces better people. So mm. I agree. And thank you so much for coming on. This was a, this was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, oh, you're and, still uh, pretty serious, though. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm pretty serious. My next book, uh, called "How yeah. Elites Ate the uh, Social Justice Movement," is out on September 5th. It's available for pre-order on Amazon and everywhere else books are sold. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for listening. As promised, here's the big nerve question for this episode: What could be a new role for universities moving forward? To play on my team, just head over to my newsletter, click the link, throw your answer in, and rate other people's answers. Looking forward to hearing what you think.